Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and you're listening to episode 153 on Castle Bank with Drs. Joe Botting and Lucy Muir. An especially warm welcome to you if you are finding this podcast through the press release and are listening for the very first time. I hope that this episode will be the most in-depth overview of this new site that you will find bar reading the academic paper itself. So Paleocast is a specialist paleontological podcast where we try to cover the whole fossil record, well beyond just dinosaurs and reciting the the various very important statistics. Uh, We try to make the academic science as approachable as possible whilst retaining as much information as we can. That said, this episode has some pretty technical language and references to some relatively obscure groups of organisms, so if you ever find yourself unsure of the meaning of anything or would like some sources of more information, just leave a comment and we can help you out. We also have multimedia to accompany this episode on our website, so if you've not already done so, please visit paleocast.com if you would like to see Castle Bank and some of the rare fossils it contains. To our returning listeners, hello, it's uh, been a while and I'm sure you all know by now that if no episode's coming out that I'm off doing biostratigraphic consultancy on some oil rig somewhere, probably in Norway. But yes, we have lots of exciting new episodes lined up, I think about five or so, of which a couple will include giveaways. Uh, I also have about half the prizes sourced for the latest Paleocast art competition, so that will likely be out in the summer. And in there somewhere I also need to be creating content for our gaming channel, and probably also finishing a virtual museum. Which we won't mention. So I might be spreading myself a bit thin, and for that reason I hope to soon finally get around to putting out an ad for some new team members. As is becoming a regular feature on the show, I would like to remind you that if you can't wait for your fossil podcast fix, then we keep a directory of other paleontological shows on our website, and we try to highlight one a week in our Paleo Podcast plug. So if it sounds good, please give them your support. Do you like hearing about some of the craziest topics in evolution, ecology, and natural history? Stuff like bone drilling worms, islands made out of poop, and chest bursting parasitoid wasps? If so, then you should check out the Primordial Soup Pot, hosted by me, Rustin Pere. And me, Aaron Johnson. Every other Thursday, Rust and I discuss weirdly awesome topics like these in a fun, hilarious, and entertaining way. Look up the Primordial Soup Pot on your podcast app of choice. And so finally, this episode is all about Castle Bank, a new Ordovician Lagerstätte, or Site of Special Preservation of Fossils, and its release to coincide with the publication of its description in the journal Nature, Ecology and Evolution. As I mentioned in the episode, it's a really nice snapshot of the process of discovering a new and significant fossil site, and hopefully it's one that we're going to be hearing about for years to come. And as always, likes, shares and comments on social media, reviews on iTunes and donations on Patreon are all encouraged and massively appreciated. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi Joe, Lucy, thank you so much for coming onto the show today. Very, very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So before we get into things, we always ask the same questions. Uh, we like to get to know you as people. So we want to know how you uh, both first got into the field of paleontology. Go on, you go first. Um, I suppose it's something I was always interested in. I was just interested in nature and science and things like that as a child. But I grew up in an area of metamorphic rocks, so I never really got to play. Oh. <laughs> Uh, and then I went to Cambridge um, initially thinking I'd specialise in plant sciences and I needed a third course in my first year and I didn't particularly want to do more chemistry. So I thought, oh, geology will be quite interesting for the year. And then I ended up doing a degree in it. Right. As you do. As lots of people do, do, in fact. And Joe? Um, I was one of those uh, kids who was just interested in everything natural history based. So, you know, beetles under logs or whatever. Human-based, not so much at all, but um, anything natural history, including fossils, I started collecting when I was about five, um, but just had no idea you could actually do it as a career until I went to university to do theoretical physics. And then, yeah, <laughs> Theoretical <hard> physics? <laughs> yeah, but 
that was before I realised quite how hard the maths got and um, and how much more fun paleontology was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's a lot less maths. It's, it's still very mathsy, but uh, not quite as much as theoretical physics. I don't expect. Um, <laughs> so, so what are your respective areas? Like, what what do you specialise in, and why did you end up in in those subsections of paleontology? Okay. Um, well, for me, the, the main thing I do is sponges and exceptional preservation. And this was because I started finding exceptionally preserved sponges during my PhD and couldn't get anyone to do them for me. Right. So um, basically, there's so so few people studying them that I had to write them up myself. And and that just kept going because there was this huge hole and because nobody else did them at all. And Lucy, what's your area? Uh, well, I'm primarily a graptolite worker. I got interested in graptolites as an undergrad purely through being supervised by Barry Rickards, yeah. who got graptolites into absolutely everything, um, and did a master's degree at Bristol where I did a project on the ecclesiastics of graptolites, which doesn't really work on graptolites, but it was worth trying. And then I was fortunate enough to get a PhD in Silurian graptolites. And then Joe dragged me into the order mission. And I still do graptolites, but I do a lot of other things like worms, and I'm interested in total communities as well, and I seem to do a lot on exceptional preservation just because we keep finding exceptionally preserved things. Yeah, basically most of what we're interesting, interested in needs exceptional preservation, and uh, and especially the ecology. So it just we've drifted more and more into that because you can do far more when you've got soft, squidgy stuff than you can with just the hard bits. Okay. Uh, so what would you both be doing if you weren't paleontologists? Oh, that's really difficult. Um, I mean, when I was about 16, 17, I was thinking of doing a variety of things. I could have gone into languages at that point. I was interested in history and eventually science won. So I'm not quite sure what I'd ended up doing if I hadn't gone into science. I could see myself being a historian. Um, if I were to stop being a paleontologist now, I'm doing all sorts of environmental work, things like community orchard and forest gardening and um, banning local, local transition groups. I might well carry on with that. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it's, um, well, apart from the theoretical physics, um, I probably end up doing the other things that I actually do to make a living nowadays, because, of course, we're not academics. Um, we've ended up living in the middle of Wales in sort of paradise and making a living other ways. So I'm also a folk musician, play the harp and do uh, folk singing things and uh, entomology. So I get paid to identify mites in soil samples and stuff. Whoa, like that. <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> Right, but we are here today for the fossils, uh, so I want to set the context first and have a look at, um, we're going to be talking about a lot about Lagerstätten today, uh, and also the Paleozoic, so um, what are Lagerstätten and why do they play such an important role in our understanding of evolution in general? Uh, uh, Lagerstätten is a, a German word. Hence that aum light in the middle of it. Um, and it's a word meaning ore. And you get two types of Lagerstätten. You get concentrate Lagerstätten, concentrated Lagerstätten, where you get lots of fossils very abundantly. So we're going to ignore them for the rest of the time. Uh, and you get concentrate Lagerstätten, which is where you get soft tissue preserved. And they're really what we're interested in. And of course, the Lagerstätten, something like the Bird of Shale, is actually both. It's got exceptionally preserved fossils and there's huge numbers of them. Um, so. The concept about Lagerstätten with the soft tissue preservation, in most um, fossil deposits, you get the hard parts that are easily preserved. You get the bones, you get the shells, you get the teeth. But you don't see the squidgy stuff. If you find a fossil ammonite, you will, won't see its tentacles. If you find a fossil mollusk, you, you won't see the squidgy edible stuff in the middle. You'll just see the hard parts. But exceptionally, in these Lagerstätten, these deposits with exceptional preservation, you will get the soft parts. And those are the only place where you get things like fossil worms, where you might get the tentacles on squid, where you might get the legs on arthropods or even the entire arthropods. And they're so important because they are the only evidence in the fossil record for lots and lots of groups. So pretty much any type of worm, its entire fossil record will be only in Conservat Lagerstätten. And loads of other things. Things like arthropods as well. There's very few actually have a mineral skeleton and the mm. depend on exception preservation to see them at all. Yeah, so they're really, in terms of our understanding of a lot of animals and plants, Lagerstätten are, are, are where it's at. Yeah, yeah, they, they're sort of disproportionately important because without them, we wouldn't be able to trace evolutionary patterns in soft tissues. We wouldn't be able to link phyla together. We'd just be seeing the, sort of the crown groups of a lot of things. And if you're interested in whole communities, if you study a normal deposit, you're only seeing the stuff with hard parts. 
if you want to see anything like the whole community, you've got to look at a Lagerstatter. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So how common are they? I mean, are, are most of our fossil knowledge coming from Lagerstatter? Um, you know, uh, <laughs> it would be nice to have every single deposit have soft body preservation. So yeah. how, how many such sites do we have in the world? Like, what are some examples? Oh, it, it's, a, it's very gradational. So there are very few sites with really exquisite soft tissue preservation. Places like the Burgess Shale, which is argued by some people to have preserved everything that was on the seafloor bigger than a microbe at the time of burial. And, uh, and those are really extremely rare things. I mean, there are something like 50 odd Burgess shale type faunas in the Cambrian, but only three or four of them are at that sort of quality. Most of them, you just get the, the tougher bits or slightly fragmented ones. Um, through the rest of the fossil record, there are um, a lot of different types of conservate lagerstat and different types of preservation and so on. Um, and again, some are extremely rich, extremely diverse. Others are much more limited. So there are probably, I guess, a few hundred uh, lagerstatten in total. But of those, very few show us a, a really good census of what was living on the seafloor at that time in total. Uh, it's certainly in anything other than a very small, isolated environment. Okay, so of of these uh, hundred or so lagerstatten, are they... <laughs> very conveniently distributed throughout <laughs> geological time are they all clumped more closely to the recent i would guess is the case or uh, do they come in like little clusters of large stetter yeah they, they are very much clumped and in general there are probably more towards the recent but it's not as clear cut as that because to get this sort of exceptional preservation you need certain combinations of conditions. So something like um, in the Carboniferous, for example, we've got the huge coal swamps, which generated um, lots of sites where you have the same sort of conditions that led to uh, precipitation of these siderite concretions that contain soft body fossils. And we only really get those during the Carboniferous. So there are loads of these faunas, floras around the world, or around quite a few continents anyway, um, but you don't get them elsewhere. So there mm. are these sort of patches because the conditions on the earth have changed through time. Likewise, we get the platen calcs like Solnhofen and uh, Hajula um, in the Jurassic and Cretaceous time, during the time where there's very high sea level, lots of epiric seas, lots of carbonate precipitation and lots of little lagoons. And the Burgess shale type faunas in the Cambrian are not totally understood, but they are very widespread in the actually the Ediacaran as well, where it's floras rather than faunas. Um, Ediacaran through the early and middle Cambrian, then they virtually stop apart from a couple in the earliest Ordovician, the, well, the early Ordovician. And, um, and that's thought to be something to do with seawater chemistry, leading to certain types of precipitation of minerals that seal the seafloor. But it's fair to say that the answers are not entirely there yet. But unfortunately, this is one of the best types of preservation that we have, and the window just closes very early on. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Um, so with with windows opening and closing and you've got these clusters, are there any areas that are, you know, particularly uh, depauperate of large Stetton? Off the top of your head? Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, most of the Ordovician, to be honest. Um, it's not true to say there aren't any. There, there are some in the Ordovician, but... Whereas in, in the Cambrian, you've got the Burger Shield type Lagerstatten, where you've got a fairly consistent preservational style and you've got a fairly consistent preservation of animals and plants, uh, a fairly consistent assemblage of animals and plants. In the Ordovician, there's a few Lagerstatten, but they all tend to be very different in terms of environment. Some of them are shallow water, some of them are deep water. Uh, in terms of the, the fauna, some of them are arthropod dominated, some seem to have no arthropods at all. So. It's, yeah, if you're trying to, if, we've got a really good understanding of at least one type of environment in the, the Cambrian, thanks to the Burgess Shield type faunas. And we can't really do that for the Ordovician because of the Lagerstatten are so different. And if anything, it gets even worse than the Silurian Devonian, where we have a few really exquisite Lagerstatten, like, um, like Herefordshire, which has um, these three dimensional soft bodied critters preserved inside accretions in a volcanic ash bed. Um, but they're isolated. They're actually 
there are very few really rich lagerstätten in the time after the Cambrian until you get to sort of Carboniferous onwards, really. There's quite a few Silurian lagerstätten in the US, but they all tend to be quite shallow water, algal dominated. So they're telling you a lot about that time and place and that environment, but they're not telling you anything about the rest of the world. Yeah, so we're seeing snippets, but we don't have a sort of a coherent picture through that sort of interval. Okay, so what I'm really hearing, and this might be a little foreshadowing, is that it'd be really nice if someone went out there and found a conservat larger setting from the Ordovician, wouldn't it? Oh, mm. it would, yes, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> someone ought to. So what, what does... Um, what do these Lagerstätten mean for our understanding of the early Paleozoic? What do, what does their distribution throughout that time mean? What does uh, the information that they contain, what can that tell us? Oh, well, really, comparing the Cambrian and the Ordovician is, is quite instructive because in the Cambrian, we've got this amazing bird of shale type faunas. We've got them at various sites around the planet, and it's a remarkably consistent assemblage that if we found a new Cambrian Lagerstätte, we'd be able to say with quite a lot of certainty what sort of animals we'd find in it. Okay. Um, even their proportions to some extent. Even to some extent, yes, because they're, they're really remarkably consistent. When it comes to the Ordovician, pretty much every single Lagerstätte is different. Yeah, mostly. In, in terms of environment and in, in terms of assemblage. So, um, for example, we've got one conservat Lagerstätte in North Wales, the Avangan biota. And that's a, a little bit like a bird of shale type fauna, but minus a lot of the arthropods. Yeah. But then you look at a conservat Lagerstätte in South Wales from the middle order, which is the Tlamashleg biota, you've got a couple of bird of shale type arthropods and all the rest of the animals are completely different. You're getting think, really classic Ordovician things like dendroid graplites yeah. and sponges. Yeah. So we're starting to see in Fezwata as well, in Morocco, and again, early Ordovician, you see the incoming of lots of the more modern groups. So horseshoe crabs turn up and things like that. But, but what we're not seeing is... Uh, they change from something which is a mixed assemblage of Burgess shale fauna type animals and um, a few of the sort of precursors and modern faunas to something which looks much more like a modern fauna. Whereas in the Ordovician as a whole, you have this biodiversification event going on from mainly from the middle to the late Ordovician, which completely transforms the structure of ecosystems. So by the end of the Ordovician, you have things like coral reefs and um, and bryozoan mounds, and the, the structure of ecosystems looks much more similar than it did in the uh, in, say the late Cambrian or the early Ordovician. But we don't see the transition in anything except the shelly faunas. We just have a few little windows in Lagerstätten through the middle and late Ordovician, but they they only tell us about very particular environments like the uh, Winnesheek showing this sort of actually a little embayment which was an, uh, an asteroid impact crater uh, which is full of Eurypterids probably in a sort of uh, mass molting or reproduction sort of area and then a few other things as well but it's just everything is a little bit strange. Yeah, so we did a paper a few years ago comparing Cambrian or Division sponge faunas and Cambrian sponge faunas are remarkably uniform globally really Whereas in the Ordovician, just looking at our small area of Mid Wales, the, the Bilsland and Windod Inlier, if you go f to different sites, even sites that might be half a mile apart of the same age, you get a different sponge fauna. And that's what the Ordovician radiation is doing, just making everything a lot more complicated. Yeah. And of course, we see that in the Shelley faunas because there's huge diversification in brachiopods and trilobites and all the rest of it. But we'd have no idea what's going on with the soft bodied animals. Because you just haven't got enough middle Ordovician Lagerstatten, yeah. or indeed Ordovician Lagerstatten at all. So, so, how those ecosystems actually worked when there were changes in the structure and the function of them is a big remaining question, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how big was this um, Ordovician biodiversification event? Like, how. How significant was it for like laying the foundations of life to come? How many, like proportionately or relatively, how many new species and groups came around at this time? Ooh, species diversity, it's something like four times as many species at the end of the Ordovician than at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and not just species, you've got new genera, new families, but you really got a change in the ecological balance. It's not just more species, it's different things. So in the Cambrian, to a very general approximation, you had an awful lot of um, things like deposit feeders in ecosystems. Whereas in the Ordovician, you start getting a lot more filter and suspension feeders. So things like dendrograptolites, sponges, bryozoans, of course, get going in the Ordovician. 
and things like deposit feeders are relatively less important. Mm -hmm. As far as we know from the shell corners. <laughs> That's always the problem. But yeah, it's enormous increase in diversity of species. and But that's only the, the small part of the story, the story, as Lucy says. Would it would it be incorrect to think of it as kind of animals sort of teenage experimental phase, where they're just trying different things, seeing what is really, what they're all really about? Probably not, I think, because yeah, that would be... I, well, I was, I was thinking probably not, because by mm. the end of the Ordovician, and you have the uh, the second biggest mass extinction at the end of it. But then it comes back again almost immediately, and you have pretty much the same ecosystems in the late Ordovician, just going on through the Silurian. And the, these marine faunas are then pretty much stable in terms of their basic structure until the Perma Triassic. Mm -hmm. So if they're experimenting, they're doing it in a remarkably sort of mature way and coming up with the best solution. <laughs> So, whereas the Cambrian, of course, you could think of as being much more sort of major body plans going everywhere and then some of them disappearing entirely. <laughs> okay, so let's go now to mid Wales. Mm -hmm. uh, so, can you walk us through the events that led you up to the discovery of this new exciting site that you found? I can indeed, although it's slightly embarrassing that we missed it for so long. Uh, so <laughs> we, uh, when we moved here um, about 10 years ago now, sort of, uh, yeah, 2013-ish, um, at one point my brother came to visit and we went for a walk over the hills and found a little pile of uh, scree, the quarry spoil that had been dumped on to make a flat area for feeding sheep on which is very common around here. And as you do, you just sort of uh, stop to just check if there's any fossils, because, you know, this is new exposure. And it turned out to be full of graptolites. And then these little black smudges, which we thought, that looks surprisingly like sponges. Um, better take a few away. So did and checked them under the microscope, and there they were. So uh, went back and bumped into the uh, farmer and found out where the uh, the spoil had come from, found out where the quarry was, went to, spoke to the landowners, and found that there were indeed lots of sponges there. And over the next sort of five or six years, we just carried on going back occasionally, built the filling up boxes and boxes. It's a good thing we've got quite a big house um, uh, with, with sponges. And um, not finding much else apart from graptolites and, you know, occasionally nautiloids or something like that. Quite a lot of trilobites, but not yeah. terribly interesting ones. Yeah, That's mostly you know, little, little baby juveniles yeah. of agaginus, but yeah. And then lockdown came along in 2020. And we thought, right, time to get this one finished off. I'll just have one more day in the field. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just collect a few more sponges and then I can write them all up and get that done. And of course, that's the day when um, the little tube with tentacles sticking out came turned up. Right, <laughs> sounds like an exciting tube with tentacles. Um, what what was it like to uncover that? You know, you you you're just there looking for sponges. All of a sudden, you've got a tube with tentacles. What was that feeling like when you recognised it? It's it's hard to, to put across because this is the sort of thing that a lot of paleontologists are really sort of looking for most of their life is something which is which is telling us things you can't get from anywhere else. And as soon as you see really soft tissue, then you know that the potential is there for a vast amount more. So I mean, we've found a few conservat lagostatin over the years, and but we've never found anything on such a small scale with such delicate soft tissues being preserved so easily. So at that point, we just knew that there was something very exciting very early on. And it took about a second to realize you were looking at something um, really quite extraordinary. And um, we didn't sleep well that night. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, you, you found your tube with tentacles. How long did it take to find the second tube with tentacles or arthropod or whatever? Because you could have just been like, well, we've we've just got this one amazing fossil in this locality. Do you, did you necessarily think, wait, there's going to be more in there? This could be something huge. Well, the second one was on the same surface. <laughs> it was right next to it. They were holding tentacles. <laughs> so at that point, and, and knowing that we also had these sponges, which also need exceptional preservation, and a lot of them there was soft tissue in as well, um, had the combination of them and finding that it was in a particular type of rock that we hadn't really been splitting because it was too much like hard work. Right. And, and there wasn't that much in it at first glance. Mm. Um, it basically changed how, how you see the outcrops and how you see yeah. how the particular layers work. And as soon as we realized that 
there was soft tissue in these particular beds, then, you know, you're onto something potentially really big and you just have to keep plugging away at it until the next thing turns up, which it did very quickly. Yeah, but it took us a while to actually fully realise what we had because the rock, when you split it, it takes seconds, maybe up to 30 seconds, for the fossils to darken so that you can see them. So when we were doing some of the early exploratory field work, just trying to work through the art drop, trying to log what was there to work out which were the best bits, I would, you know, split a bit of rock and go, all right, Joe, there's three blackie pods on here and there's a funny blob. Have a look at the blob. And I'd hand the rock over to Joe and he'd say, but there are seven blackie pods on here. <laughs> and your three more, four more blackie pods had appeared in the time it took me to hand the rock to Joe. So I hate to think what we threw away early on, <laughs> do not realising this. <laughs> how, how does it change? It's basically when, when you first split them, they are silver films on a sort of silvery grey rock. And okay. then quite often the organic stuff just gradually darkens. And I, I'm not sure if there's any significant chemical change because it's still carbon in, uh, in SEM and on the elemental mapping. Um, but it, there's certainly a visual change. Mm -hmm. and if That's you get lovely. Light, you can sort of see them appearing magically under your hand lens. <laughs> oh, wow. That sounds so cool. <laughs> it's quite fun, but it was slightly annoying when we discovered that after a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can imagine like just passing it over just being like yeah there's nothing on that and you've just then missed this amazing soft-bodied <laughs> fossil um so so what happened then you you've got all of these amazing fossils what do you do do you just have them all like lying in your garage do you <laughs> do you have to report them to the government did did the landowner have to get involved and did uh, did the fossils belong to them what how yeah. yeah. Well, we were in the quarry with the permission of the landowner anyway, yeah. of course, because that's something you, you always have to do. And they were actually really interested yeah. in the fossils and very supportive. And yeah. um, leaping ahead a bit, they, they were actually the ones who suggested crowdfunding to get microscopes. Yeah, they've been incredibly supportive the whole way through. And um, it's just lovely to have them on board. Mm -hmm. So they were just sort of saying, yeah, go to it. Do what you want. Dig some more. Yeah. <laughs> but because yeah. the fossils are so small, most of them are millimetre sort of scale. We really did, needed a good microscope to study them because we, we had a small, adequate microscope, but we just weren't seeing the detail of the fossils in that. And worse still, we weren't able to illustrate them. Mm. So um, this might be leaping ahead a bit, but, uh, but to answer the other bit of the question, the, there's no requirement that um, fossil finds are sort of reported to authorities or anything like that in the UK. It's a bit different to archaeology. Um, so... And if you do get thing, get a site actually um, preserved as a triple SI, for example, which is the, the, the main sort of uh, legislation to protect them, then the site is then made public. So anyone can find exactly where it is, which okay. can be problematic, mm -hmm. especially with a site like this. Because yeah, the, is it that you want to keep it secret and, and keep, you know, like amateur hunters away from just like hacking half of it out of the cliff? That's a large part of it. I mean, we've got nothing against amateurs because we're technically amateurs. Um, it's, the problem is that it is such a sensitive site. We're looking at an interval which is producing these, um, the, the really exquisite fossils within about a 10 centimeter thickness in one small quarry. And we don't know how far this extends. So somebody right. going in with, say, a pickaxe and a sledgehammer, Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not so much amateurs, but commercial collectors, for example. If right. somebody got wind of this and they could find, say, oh, I don't know, something ridiculous like an Oprah Binyard, no, I mean, they might want to sell that for a few thousand pounds or something like that. And you just yeah. need one, some, one person going in and potentially destroying most of the fauna. And also, because the fossils are so small, we can find them because we're both incredibly short-sighted. <laughs> and we can see them <laughs> millimetre long in the field. And most people can't. And we've had a lot of practice. Yes. And... Even the sponges, we've we've taken other paleontologists to this area and shown them what look like really nice sponges to us, and they say, that's a fossil. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we're kind of trained in these sort of fossils, and most people just wouldn't see them at all, yeah. but would destroy it in the process. So so we want to keep the site secret to protect the site, not because we want to keep all the fossils to ourselves. Yeah. Right, uh, okay. The landowners were a bit reluctant to have the site location made public because they didn't want people traipsing into their field. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's... Obviously, we need to respect their wishes as well. Absolutely. So it's a combination of things, really. Yes. But I mean, it's not, not that we're keeping it completely secret. So they, anyone who needs to know can find out. 
It's just okay. that we're not publishing it online. Yeah, and the, the published specimens are going to the and get the company, the National Museum of Wales. Yeah. And the exact site location is kept with the specimens. So it's available. So someone in 50 years' time could find out where they're from. Yeah, absolutely. But, but it's just for the moment, because the site is so sensitive, hmm. then we, we, we need to keep yeah. it a secret. That may change in future. Yes. You know, once we've got a museum and a visitor centre <laughs> built on top. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you started off this section saying that uh, it was embarrassing that you didn't spot it earlier. But, you know, you, you are the probably the best people in the world I could think of to spot that. Have um, Had anyone ever, you know, like looked at the site in the past and sort of just didn't recognize it because i always find that wherever i look in the uk if there's if there's like some fossil deposit someone in the 1850s has looked at it and said oh there was this here and that there like there's not not very much land in the uk that hasn't been studied geologically so is there any record of people saying like oh i, I cracked a rock and there were three brachiopods nothing much <laughs> No, I mean, the, the quarry is actually very young. Um, it was only dug sort of 15 years ago, something like that. Um, okay. there, there are stories attached to it as well. But a couple we'll of into versions. It. But, um, but, uh, <laughs> but the, the, the area has been done quite well, the built on Mindod Inlier, but in terms of the stratigraphy. So Gertrude Ellis, for example, hmm. has worked out the graphite bar stratigraphy and did it very well. And the nice thing about Gertrude Ellis's papers, I've been to several of her sections and if she says that there is a bed of x there then it's still there yeah. you can just go and find things because she was so accurate and mm. but because she was interested in the graphite biostrography and just working out the structure uh, of the area and things like that they con she concentrated on the graphite which are biostratigraphically useful and similarly people in north wales concentrated on the trilobites to do their biostratigraphy and the trilobites here too and, uh, indeed so mm. we're really fortunate in wales we've got a very very good framework we know what the rocks are we know where they are we know how old they are but the whole communities haven't necessarily been worked out. Yeah, in many cases, the sites that we've been working on the last 20 years or so, um, the most abundant fossils turn out to be sponges, paleoscleaked worms, or stylophthan echinoderms, um, none of which had ever been reported by anyone before. <laughs> um, <Okay. laughs> so, um, but no, this site in particular, nobody has looked at previously as far as we know. We've since finding it, we've been going back through our collections and going to other sites where the same sort of sedimentology turns up, trying to find if there's any equivalence elsewhere. Um, no sign of anything like it yet. All right. So um, with the graptolites and the biostratigraphy, they are brilliant uh, index fossils for being able to date rocks. So do you have graptolites in um your new site and if so do you have a really strong control on the age of the deposit oh yes yes uh <laughs> we've got the, the most abundant graphite at the site is didymograptus marchisone the classic tuning fork graphite which pretty much gives you the age on its own and we've got a couple of other um bacterial graphites that really tie the age down to what was it was the later part of the marchisone biozone yeah so yeah we've got a very very precise and accurate handle on exactly how old it is. Yeah, so it's about 461 million years, give Ish, or take a yes. Wednesday or two. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's brilliant that you can date it to that um, accuracy. Yeah, um, I did but, if you were asking, uh, since there's a volcanic ash band in the quarry, you know, can, can you get some uh, um, radiometric dating on there and get an accurate age? And we said, that's not going to be as accurate as the graptolites. <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. <laughs> that is fantastic, because yeah, uh, thinking about so many different Lagerstätter, they'll they'll go on an isotopic age or something mm -hmm. like that based on ash. But here, now the Graptolites own Mid Wales. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> in terms of stratigraphy, and we have got okay, some ash really... beds in the quarry as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so we've got ash beds, we've got Graptolites, we've we've got a, a real strong control on the age. Um, so there's ash falling in there. So there's volcanoes around. Uh, can you paint a uh, a picture of what this um, uh, environment was like? What the paleo environment was like? What was the depositional setting? How did this rock come about? Absolutely. Yeah. The um, the reason we work in the built-in line, the reason it's so interesting, is it is basically a fossilized volcanic island sequence. 
So we've got the entire history of a volcano from before it emerges through the main volcanic phase, through a sort of what we think is a caldera collapse interval, and then the gradual erosion back under the sea. And Castle Bank is in the middle of the sequence. So we've had the, the, the most expansive volcanic eruptions, and this is in the sort of declining phase where there are still eruptions going on about five miles to the south. And there was a little um, pillow basalts just yeah, fairly close by in the sequence. Um, so what we're looking at is an environment on the side of a, an eroding volcanic cone. And trying to work out the water depth is always tricky. I and mean, we've got a few algae, um, but we do have a bit of a handle on it because there is a big change in the faunas um, around storm wave base. And we've done this in a couple of papers on the echinoderms and the sponges, where you get typical shallow water faunas that live in turbulent environments and then deeper water ones that seem to just like it really quiet. And in echinoderms, for example, that means change from um, mostly crinoids to entirely stylophthems and sea cucumbers and things like that. Um, and then there's a gap in the middle where there's almost nothing except starfish, and those are very rare. And that's exactly the gap we're into here. So we have the only echinoderms we've got here are starfish and a couple of odd stylophthons that we don't see anywhere else. Okay, that's an incredibly accurate picture. So not only have we got a, a really accurate date, we've also got a, a, a location on a volcanic island chain, sort of like the Caribbean. Um, yeah, we, I think the, the best comparison in terms of size and volcanism is probably Santorini. It's okay. that sort of scale, sort of 10 kilometer wide caldera complex with cones in various places around the edges um, in a sort of semi-eroded state. So it probably would look a bit like Santorini does today, where it's partly submerged. Some of it is still sort of uh, sticking up. But, okay. And, and then we've got a bathymetry, a, a paleo depth to the water. So yeah, approximately, <laughs> yeah, so approximately <laughs> loose, but that that's in, it's an incredibly accurate picture already that you've got of this large uh, yeah. large <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it's more than I would have expected, you know, at this early stage and compared to other uh, localities, perhaps. Yeah, and there's so, still a lot of questions there. Yeah, well, we have been working on the the area for twenty five years in Joe's yeah. case, so. In, in terms of the overall picture of what happened and when, we've we actually got it down fairly yeah. well. Yeah, we got a good picture of the, the sort of ecological framework that was going on. So being able to slot it into a picture like that is much easier than doing it from scratch. But even so, exactly whether this was next to a sort of submarine cliff or what the topography looked like on the seafloor, things like that, is, which are actually critical to the preservation and what sort of ecology we've got, are still a little bit up in the air. We'd want to pin down a lot more yet. Okay. Um, so how are the fossils preserved? Did you say that they were uh, a carbonaceous film, that it was just the, the carbon? Yeah, it's basically carbon films. Um, there is a little bit of uh, pyrite mineralization as well. You get flamboids in some fossils. Some you don't see really any trace of flamboids at all. All the elemental mapping just comes out as carbon. And this includes things like sponges, which have very sort of squidgy, delicate, soft tissues and a mineral mm. skeleton. The mineral skeleton's dissolved. We've just got the carbon. Yeah, these isn't things. that silica for a sponge? It is for these ones, yeah. So yeah. you you don't have any of the the sponge's actual spongy sponge skeleton. You just have the <laughs> the body. In some cases, we've got the carbonaceous component of the spicules. So there are some of these only okay. ones actually had um, quite thick organic sort of outer walls on them, and we we see those. Um, but it's, it applies not just to sponges. So uh, the trilobites, all the calcitic things are also dissolved. Even the phosphatic fossils, we get uh, phosphatic brachiopods abundantly, and what they're preserved as is carbon. The phosphate's all gone. So basically right. everything is dissolved except the carbon, as far as we can see. Right, okay. It's kind of like, it's sort of the opposite to normal, isn't it? In normal preservational conditions for any yeah. other site? Wow. Absolutely. I mean, th this is often the case with these sites of exceptional preservation that you don't get the things preserved that you'd expect to, you because you've got some sort of weird chemical conditions going on, which preserve a component that's normally not stable. But those conditions themselves tend to be detrimental to the minerals that might be involved instead. Okay. And how good is the preservation? Like, um, down to what scale can we get uh, things preserved? Are we are we 
we're not quite down to cellular sizes, but you know, are we? I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, hello. You know, well, our Swedish colleagues did uh, dissolve the rocks and got out phase carbonation means so-called small carbonaceous fossils. So mm-hmm. I mean, the things like decapods, paleoscopic worms, bits of arthropods, and there you possibly are seeing cellular structures on the surfaces of those films. Yeah. But you're bearing in mind that a lot of fossils are on a millimetre scale anyway, and we're seeing details like small hairs and spines. We are getting sort of micron scale level of preservation. Yeah. And certainly the paleoscoleicids, for example, the, we have beautiful arrays of plates, micro plates, and the micro plates can be a micron size. And we've, we've got entirely soft bodied animals, which have, um, which that's two or three millimeters long, which have tentacles coming out the top and there are fine filaments coming off those tentacles. So we're looking at structures. Well, the, one of the little arthropods has a gut that's 20 microns wide, for example. Yeah. And um, we think we've got uh, brain tissue in one of the arthropods, which again yeah. is tiny arthropods. Yeah. So we're really getting very, very small scale yeah. preservation. And we've got the brains eye. and guts. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've got the eye, optic nerve, and then the sort of uh, fairly normal sort of early arthropod brain type arrangement of nerves. Yeah. It's, guess, it's at the sort of scale where we're really having difficulty imaging it using an optical microscope. And we've tried putting some of these things in SEM. And unfortunately, the carbon film is just a bit too thin and it doesn't show up well. Mm. So we're going to have to think of different ways of imaging just to really be able to see the very finest detail. Yeah, we're working with uh, Luke Perry, for example, who thinks he has a technique that might work with SEM on these extremely thin films. But, um, but yeah, the preservation is kind of ridiculous. I mean, these fossils, people often see them, and we've had this with reviewers. They take a look at them and they well, they don't look as pretty as Cheng Zhang. <laughs> <You see, laughs> because the thing is, you're looking at, in some cases, an arthropod a millimetre long. Rather than 10 centimetres. And yet it still has the same sort of details preserved in it as something 10 centimetres long in, say, the Burgess or Cheng Zhang. So the level of preservation is, I think, similar in the best specimens in terms of the, uh, the fidelity of it. Wow. So like the, the fidelity, I was trying to remember the word, that is essentially like the the resolution at which the, the fossil record can preserve things, right? Yeah, pretty much. We're, we're seeing the same details in these as you are seeing in, sometimes in much larger fossils in the other Burgess Shale type faunas. Yeah. So how, how does it actually compare to all the other Burgess Shale type largest data that we have in the Cambrian. I, mean, I know that we, you said that there were optic nerves and things. I know those are preserved in Shenzhang, for example. Yeah. So yeah, and how, how does it measure up? Well, it's, it, in term, it, it's difficult to say at this stage because, you know, it's been two of us collecting for two and a half years. Uh, so it's very early stages, but in terms of the diversity, we're well over 150 species in total which um, puts us above, in terms of diversity, most of the previously known um, Burgess shale type fauna. So you know, things like Chengzhang and Burgess and so on are um, substantially higher than that. I mean, Chengzhang, I think, is over 300 now. Um, but, and again, there are very few uh, of those conservated lagostatin in the Cambrian that have things like the brain tissue or guts preserved fairly commonly. And we've got guts in several different groups. Um, so, it certainly has the features that characterize the best of them, um, but we're at the very early stages, and certainly it's not as abundant or as spectacular looking as, say, the Burgess. If you go to the Greater Philippod bed and split those, you just got soft body things everywhere, yeah. and here it's a lot harder work. Uh, so the Burgess shales we've worked on for over the century and from a lot more rock than we've got. Yes. So you are going to get better specimens from the Burgess just because there's a lot more material. You are, but then, but also you go to the best beds in these sites and you will get abundant soft-bodied things yes. in just a, a small area. Whereas, the, So we're not saying that it's competing with those in, in that sense. But the real difference, I suppose, and what, why it's important is that this is a totally different time interval. So we don't have any equivalent things to this in the Ordovician. Feswata is spectacular, but it comes from dozens of sites across the desert, uh, and each of those sites is relatively um, relatively non-diverse. Some of them are more diverse than others. And there are relatively few completely soft-bodied animals there. So it's, it's giving us a different balance of taxa, a different balance of preservation as well. Um, but there's nothing in the Ordovician that 
it shows us this sort of information, basically. Mm. Okay. So, right, we've uh, cracked a rock open, we've left it to the side to cure for a bit. <laughs> All these fossils are now coming to the forefront. Uh, what different groups of organisms are we going to be able to see? Well, some of them we're not quite sure yet, of course. <laughs> but at the moment, the answer is kind of pretty much everything. Um, we would sometimes in the early days when we were sort of all enthusiastic and excited, which we still are, um, on the way, to, on the walking out to the quarry, we'd think, so what do we want to find today then? Um, an open idiot. And, um, and guess what turns up? <laughs> so it, That actually happened? Yeah. Yes. Um, no. Three or four oh. times. <laughs> Oh, it's a bit silly, really. I'm so jealous. <laughs> but we've got it's something like 15 phyla, we think. Some of them, we're pretty certain we know what they are, but it's going to need a bigger paper to demonstrate it. So we put something, there's one thing, the most abundant one, which is this um, little tube with tentacles sticking out that was the first thing that turned up. We actually have lots of material and we're pretty sure what we know what we are, but we can't say anything because it'll be under a press embargo when we actually publish it. I think it's something right. with virtually no other fossil record yeah. for that phylum. And there are two or three other groups which have one or two fossils, if that, that are known. Um, so... We're getting, and there are something like 30 or 40 species of sponges, 30 odd arthropods at least. We've got several phyla of worms. I mean, there are things that look like kinorhynchs, annelids, multiple papulid species, phaleus gleek, it's all over the place. Yeah, we've got the normal shelly stuff. We've got um, phosphatic brachiopods, which you'd expect to find at this sort of um, environment and age. Yeah. A couple of blazoans, occasional nautiloids, lots of graptolites, yep. planktonic and benthic. It, including with soft tissue? And, yeah, well, only in the benthic ones. Mm. We got really excited at one point where we found a didymograptid, one of these tuning fork graptolites, with a sort of blob with what looked like tentacles on it. And mm -hmm. we got incredibly excited because of graptolite soft tissue basically doesn't exist. Mm. There's a couple of sites that's known for them. Yeah. Um, and so we got tremendously excited thinking, oh, soft tissue and a planktonic graptolite were famous among <laughs> graptolite workers. Um, and then we looked really closely and realised it was something stuck to the outside rather than the inside. So it's just, ah. it's just some sort of soft body worm. But, but it's something with a little sort of boingy stalk and then a little blobby body and tentacle array. So it looks like a graptolite zooid, but it's on the outside of the colony. Yes. But then there are other things that it might be. But I, it's the sort of thing we really need a second specimen. There's an awful lot of things where if we had another one, we could probably write it up, but we yeah. just want something else so we can be sure the features we're seeing are consistent. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, we have various things that, again, we, we can't quite tell you about yet because uh, we're working on them, but in the things in the paper include stuff like... Um, well, there's one arthropod that is intriguing um, because it looks a bit like an insect. And it can't possibly be. I mean, no, it doesn't. It, it can't be an insect from it the can't. old vision. But it looks like it seems to have six legs. It's got a sort of inflated abdomen, which is softer than the thorax. It looks like it's got an antenna. We, we don't know for certain. Um, but we need another. It's one of those things where we need another specimen before we can really make sense of it. But yeah, the, it's, <laughs> the first insect, otherwise, if I am right from my documentary consultancy, would be Rhyniella or something, is it? it be, from the yeah. Devonian? Yeah, it would. Um, but of course, oh, I've impressed myself there. <laughs> hey, I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah, basically, once you start getting terrestrial ecosystems, you start getting insects. But mm. we have almost no idea what the immediate marine ancestors of insects and hexapods yeah. look like because I mean, the closest relatives today are things like pericarid crustaceans that look nothing like them. Mm. Um, and of course, <laughs> insect, well, well, the ancestors of insects were presumably diversifying the Ordovician along with other stuff during the Ordovician biodiversification. But because there's so few Ordovician calls about Lagerstatten, we don't really know what non-biomimilized arthropods were doing at that time. Yeah. So there could be all sorts of things happening and we just have no <laughs> clue because normally they don't get preserved. Yeah. And at the same time, we have things that are pretty certain of barnacles, uh, which have almost no record in these early stages. And then they, you have, on the other hand, things that look like Cambrian critters. I think there's one which looks like a Yohoya, this sort of classic Burgess shale thing, except it's not quite right. I know we were <laughs> working with Steve Pates and he's sort of squinting at it and thinking that, it's got too many segments in these limbs. Um, so mm. at that point, you're looking at something which seems to have Cambrian-type morphologies, but may not actually be closely related to those Cambrian morphologies. So in many cases, 
they're going to need a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, it's If you find a new bird of shale type fauna in the Cambrian, you pretty much can just find a, um, a fossil and then match it up to something that's already been known, more or yeah. less. It might be a new species, but the groups are more or less consistent. Here, almost everything seems to be new. Yeah. Um, and maybe not closely related to anything previously. This is so exciting. Um, <laughs> so, what proportion are you know? What what proportion are known new species, and what proportion are unknown? Known new oh, species. Who, who was it? George Bush <laughs> was going on about known unknowns and unknown unknowns, and. I think I yeah, know what so, you mean. Though. Yeah, you know what I mean. Everyone yeah, knows so, what I mean. It's so fine. I it up this morning, and in terms of species that have been named from elsewhere, that's basically things like the graptolites and blackipods and trilobites. Yeah. Um, so even taking that at genus level, we're talking between twenty and thirty taxa uh, have already been named by someone, not necessarily us. Yeah. And right. then we've published a few things. Joe's done some of the sponges, and of course Steve Bates uh, did the um, and the the opinioid. Yeah. Last year. But almost everything is completely new and unknown, and we're going to have to publish yeah. them eventually. It, and even the sponges, um, there are new families in there, there, and there are completely new sort of genera that are related to modern groups and shouldn't be around at this time. And it's, you know, it's there's almost nothing in the in the exceptionally preserved stuff that we can match up with known species. Um, so we're looking at, I would guess, a hundred. 130, 140 new species or something like that so far. Um, but in many cases, it's going to take more specimens before we can actually put a name on them, as in actually formally describe them. Paleoscalicids, we don't know for certain yet because you can only identify them in electron microscope. But every time we go out, we find something new, so we certainly haven't come to the end of it. Yeah, literally every time we go out, we find at least one or two more new things to add to the list. Wow. <laughs> um, what haven't you found what's what's missing is anything missing a few things we haven't really got fish we've got a couple of things we think might be chordates but we really really need better material yeah. of those yeah. we've got some chronodont elements we've got the isolated teeth and a couple of better plate assemblages but nothing with soft tissue so that's something we might expect to see and haven't yet yeah we haven't got plaques elements <laughs> uh, but one of the pecu peculiar things is that, and this is actually quite important, is that they try the bites. We have four species, but one of them is a single vib, vib fragment, and two of them are very few specimens. Mm. Almost all of them are one ubiquitous species, a thing called a Gyginus condensis that occurs in every environment in the built in layer until it goes extinct from shallow to deep water, and it gets to sort of five or six centimetres quite commonly. It's quite a big, chunky thing, and it's abundant. And it's fairly common here as well, but it doesn't get more than about five millimetres. We only have juveniles. They're quite abundant, yep. and we tend to get them complete or possibly as molts. Yep. So it's telling us something critical about the ecology. I mean, interpreting why so many of these fossils are small is a real challenge but but in the case of that trilobite species we're pretty certain that it is some sort of nursery zone that the it, for some reason it wasn't supporting adults and this species was just using it to reproduce in not exclusively here you do get juveniles in other environments as well but not nearly as abundantly yeah Ah, that was going to be my question. I was, I was working on a hypothesis on this live. <laughs> I was just like, what if the juveniles are a bit squidgier and they're always in every environment, but they're just not preserved normally? But here you've got something where they are capable of being preserved. So then you've got all these tons of squidgy, tiny little trilobites that were just everywhere. Does That's that work? Does that hold water? An interesting idea. Exactly. We're still not seeing the adults in this environment, so there's yeah. still a difference. We're, we're missing the adults yeah. at that point. Mm. We do get occasional isolated sclerites of adults, mm. presumably washed in. So, you know, a Libregina three or four centimetres long. Um, but you, we haven't found a single complete adult. Hey, um, in the comments, everyone, write down your hypotheses. Yeah, yeah. Someone's <laughs> going to be right. <laughs> we, we've done this a couple of times now where, oh. where we have this big question and we're, we ask everyone to try and think about a possible answer. That but anyway, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but let's, let's leave it up to the audience to decide. 
Yeah, and the, the the size is an interesting question, though, isn't it? Because I mean, we it's not as if we only get small things, because the sponges are quite often two, three centimeters, and we do get larger fossils mixed in with it. I mean, we've got an algal type thing which is four or five centimeters as well. So it's not as if we can't preserve the big things. It's just mm. that we only seem to have small things. Yeah, and in general, what we don't see is bits of larger things either. So. From the preservation we're getting, we might expect to see uh, just segments of bigger arthropods that are a few millimetres long. Yeah, mulch fragments or yes. something like that. If and it... by and large, we're not getting that. We've got a few yeah. specimens. Yeah. But in general, no. So it's basically not being winnowed is what we're saying. Mm. It's not just a sort of a sedimentological bias because wow. we're not getting the same size of small bits. Uh, sorry, the same pie, sized pieces of larger animals. And we are getting some larger animals. Mm. So um, it, it's probably a, a slightly odd ecosystem that's being preserved here. And we have some ideas that we're sort of looking into in terms of possibly explaining that. Okay, that's still very much work in progress. It is, it is, yeah. It's... Not going into the paper. <laughs> I like that this site is just a, a snapshot in, you know, like a huge, complicated evolutionary process. And I like that this interview today is just a snapshot into a longer process of describing of discovering describing understanding this site and there's so many unanswered questions that are just running through my mind and it's a really it's a really interesting point to come into uh, having a discussion about the site when there's like so many unknowns so much stuff to work out something so new um how long do you reckon it'll be until you're, if you will ever be able to piece everything together? <laughs> oh, it's something we're thinking about all the time, and we know a lot more than we did even a year ago. Yeah. But we'll still keep working on it as long as we can get access to the site, really. It's, this could go on for decades. Yeah, and you think of somewhere like the Burgess Shale, for example, which has been studied intensively for uh, by numerous people over the last century. Do we still, do we even now have a complete answer to it? There's still new species being described from it. There's still new interpretations of the ecology and even the origin of the fossils, whether they're coming down in the slumps or how many of them are living in situ. Um, so I'm not sure it will be one where we ever get a definitive answer and everything is clear cut. Uh, but the longer we work at it, and like Lucy says, it probably will be decades, um, hopefully it'll be decades, mm -hmm. the more information we'll have. And and the other thing is, we're nowhere near the end of the, the number of species yet. And yeah. yeah, you can do sort of verification curves or species abundance ones to see when the, the, the new discoveries start leveling off. And they haven't been leveling off. And we're still getting new stuff all the time. And many of them, ones we've got, are single specimens still. Is it is it still increasing? So oh, yeah, if, yeah. if we explain what these like collector curves are, if you if you look at a site and then look at how many new species it produces, that is predictable in terms um, of numbers. Kind of. You get a sort of you get a curve which basically um, uh, leans over and becomes closer and closer to horizontal. So if if it's horizontal, then you're not finding anything new. And okay. And at the moment, we're still finding things at pretty much the, well, about the same rate as we were a year ago, or maybe even two years ago, almost. Yeah, so, so many of the exceptional things we've got one or two specimens of per species. Um, so we're not even really getting repeats of existing things very often. Yeah. And usually if we find a, a, a spectacularly preserved arthropod, which doesn't happen very often, so they are quite rare things there compared with worms and so on, then it'll be something we haven't seen before. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. But, um, um, <laughs> okay, so we're, we're not reaching the limit in terms of uh, biological diversity yet, but are we reaching the physical limit of the quarry? Nope. nope. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> because you have to work on such a minute scale for these, and they are, in some cases, the entire animal is a millimeter long, as we said. One to three mm. millimeters is normal size. Um, it can take an hour to break down a block the size of your fist because you have to do it so minutely. So we've gone through um, probably about three or four square meters of the, um, if that. If that, probably not quite that. Yeah, probably less than that, actually, of this interval, which is about 10 to, 10 to 15 centimeters thick. 
Um, uh, so three or four square meters, everyone's just thinking that out in their head. And that yeah. has yielded a hundred odd new yeah. species. A couple of dining tables worth. Yeah. Oh. And we unfortunately this whole area is cut by faults on either side. So mm. we may only have about a you know a, a two hundred meter long section to go at. <laughs> Still quite a lot of uh, <laughs> potential fossils though. Um, yeah, I can see how you would want to keep that secret because if I was there with my pickup truck and <laughs> in a table sized yeah. finger rock, <laughs> that's the thing. Off, driving off with hundreds of species potentially. <laughs> you get the right levels, and it's almost you just have no idea what's going to turn up next. It's it's kind of like a lottery. Yes. Look, let's pull it all together now. How how does everything fit together? What is the significance of what you found? What's the significance of the plants and animals that you've discovered so far? It's telling us really what one ecosystem in the Middle Order Division was like. And it's telling us it was quite different from the Cambrian ones and also seems to be a bit different to the other Order Division ones we got a good handle on. It's very different from the Preservata faunas, for example. And it's what we're not seeing is a little bit interesting. Um, in the Cambrian border shield type faunas, arthropods are dominating with Spongia second. But here we've got arthropods and we've got diverse arthropods, but we haven't got abundant arthropods. In fact, there's several phyla I think are more abundant than the arthropods in terms of exceptionally preserved taxa. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Including this little uh, tube thing with the tentacles coming out. That's actually the most abundant um, soft bodied animal that we've got. Uh, with hundreds of tubes and probably 30 or 40 of the ones with soft tissue in them. Uh, so, so yes, the ecology is one aspect. But the other thing is that unlike the Cambrian, where most things are already known to some extent, here almost everything is potentially very important for understanding the evolution of particular groups. So, for example, the barnacles. We've got a couple of specimens, a couple of, yeah, a couple of species, couple, two or three specimens. Um, there is a potential barnacle from the first water, but it's not really very convincing and doesn't really have that many characters. Hmm. After that, I think you have to wait till the Carboniferous when you start getting things that look more like modern barnacles. Um, so just having one specimen there, which is well preserved and you can trace the plate arrangements and so on, is enough to give us a huge new handle on how they evolved. And we're getting this for almost every soft-bodied animal that we find. There's very little that is not telling us something new. Um, so those opabinioids, for example, that um, uh, Pate, Steve Pates described with us few, um, few, a couple of months back, um, uh, are giving us a new angle on the origin of um, certain critical features in new arthropods. Like well, the, the potential is that it's showing us a new way of looking at how things like the labrum evolved in modern arthropods, which is this sort of plate that covers the mouth and how the different types of appendages are related at the front of the animal. Um, so, yeah, be, because everything is different, the potential importance of each fossil is quite spectacular. Yes. But it's going to take a lot of work in each case before we can really pin down exactly how important it is. Yeah. So it'll come back in 10 years' time and we can tell you then. <laughs> I mean, ideally, what we want is another site from five miles away from the same sort of environment so we can see how different the ecology is over that sort of scale. Because with the sponges in the built-in layer, as I mentioned earlier, if you go to different sites of the same age, you've got a different sponge fauna. But things like the bacchipods and trilobites and graptolites will be exactly the same. So we don't know whether the things like the worms and the other arthropods will behave like the bacchipods and that the, they're the same over the wide area, or if they're like the sponges, that they're completely different than if you go to a new place. And that would be yeah. so interesting to know that, because yeah. that would give us a much better handle on what the Ordovician radiation was doing for soft body things. Yeah. And extrapolating into total biodiversity. Um, you can imagine if you've got very little overlap between sites in a small area, then your estimates of the total diversity of, say, the Welsh Basin goes to the roof. Mm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, there's all these things that it might tell us. At the moment, this, this paper is basically an announcement. It's sort of, there's only preliminary implications that we can actually make as new discoveries in the sense of new information that we can then put into our models immediately. Um, mm. But it's really telling us about the potential of what 
else we might learn from it. And to show also that this window of Burgess Shale type preservation still exists in the Middle Ordovician. Because people don't really look for it because it's not meant to exist at this time. Yeah. And Castle Bank can't be the only Middle Ordovician conservat luggage data out there. There's got to be at least one other somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd like someone to find it. Well, we've got things like Winnishik, but, well, yes, but yes, of this yes, style, yeah. Yes. You would think that whatever the conditions were that created this preservation at this particular site, it must have occurred elsewhere. And yeah. there are lots of volcanic islands in the Ordovician for people to look for similar conditions in. <laughs> it's exciting. Um, so, so what is that's looking at the site? What's what's next for you? Um, so, do you get first dibs on all of the fossils that? Come, well, I guess you do because you're the only ones that know where it is. Um, yeah. So, do you, are those fossils yours? Uh, if you collaborate with people, are you basically the key to this site? and everyone has to come through you now? For the moment, yes, because apart from anything else, I'm not sure the landowners would be happy welcoming lots more people involved. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but basically, we want this fauna studied. So part of the reason for doing this sort of announcement paper is to drum up lots of interest and excitement for them um, to get other people who are specialists in particular groups where we just don't have the expertise. And the announcement paper involves some colleagues in Sweden who are studying the, the microfossils. We've got our Chinese colleagues who did some elemental mapping to work out the taphonomy. Yeah. Uh, Lucy McCobb, uh, Angiatha Convey is studying, studying the trial bites. Yeah. Steve Fates has just done me either and then these possibly going to do some of the other arthropods, yeah. I hope. Luke yeah. Harry's working on some of the mysterious and interesting things. <laughs> so and it's not that we're keeping it all to ourselves. We just want lots of people to get involved at the moment because we actually have a major input into the papers, not just the geological background, but in terms of uh, and finding the things, but actually in interpreting them because we're excited by all of them. Mm -hmm. Then we're likely to be on all of the first set of papers. But, um, but eventually, of course, if we're not having a major input, then then we won't be authors. It'll just we just want the things to be to be studied. Yeah. Um, and at the moment, of course, we've got very good microscope equipment, which is essential for imaging. Yes. The the, the, the fossils. Yeah. So Steve Pates, for example, he was actually working on Meriwether and when the pandemic was in full swing, and he couldn't get into his lab in Cambridge. So <laughs> when it was possible to travel, he actually visited here and used our equipment. Yeah. Is it, yeah, it's probably a good time to mention the yes. uh, the microscopes. I was just going to ask how how did you. Uh, have better access to ridiculously good microscopes than <laughs> Cambridge, the University of Cambridge. Well, well it's uh, the, the landowner, really, because we were bewailing the fact that we had all these wonderful but tiny fossils and we just couldn't see them properly with our microscope. And if only we had better equipment. And he said, why didn't you try for crowdfunding? And we said, oh, no, we couldn't possibly. And I thought, well, why can't we? And, and then we decided that we could and we did. Yeah, because uh, it's, we have to reiterate, we're not employed as scientists, we're as academics most of the time. We get short-term fellowships in China every now and then, but basically we're working freelance, so we're not eligible for the grants. I and mean, people okay. start suggesting palace funding and so on, and the grants stipulate that you have to have an academic post in order to get the large grants for equipment. Mm -hmm. So the only option we had was crowdfunding, because we certainly couldn't afford it. Yep. And it was we were blown away. We had something like eighteen thousand pounds was eventually contributed um, from over a hundred different people, yeah. um, L largely local people who are you know, probably interested in science and then the fossils, but you know it's not their hobby or anything like that. But uh, we're quite well known locally, and people obviously just want to support us. Yeah. Yeah, wow. so we ended up getting two very nice Leicas, um, some nice cameras and a thousand quid camera. And we had a bursary from the um, Warwickshire Geological Conservation Group for £2,000. Mm -hmm. uh, we had discounts from um, GT Vision, the microscope supplier who was sort of wanting to support us as well. And we ended up getting better microscopes than most universities. Yeah, and so, we've got a cam camera lucida uh, equipment, which is basically a mirror on a stick. We really don't know what that is. And that means you can look down the microscope and draw what you see. And for something mm. like graptolites, that's a bit of 19th century equipment and it's still used. It's still essential. But I, I think even the National Museum of Wales doesn't have one. Yeah, you try finding one of those nowadays. Yes. Uh, but with, with things like cross polarizing ring lights, that made such a difference. And the, it's still carbon films are very difficult to image because you get sort of reflections or you don't get reflections. And something like that just makes these things leap out in mm. spectacular fashion. 
we got fluorescence kit as well. Somebody else wanted to contribute a, a chunk for fluorescence, so that is actually useful. Yeah. And we found the cross polars are useful in, in image, even standard fossils, so things like graphite. Just they're amazing cross polars because it increases the contrast and they look yeah. so much better. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's one of these things. We now wonder how we managed it without it for all these years. I'm just imagining this uh, crowdfunding campaign that is. <sighs> You would, you would put it on saying, hey, we're amateur fossil collectors. We've discovered a world, um, like an amazing, like grade one fossil site uh, in the local rocks. Uh, you can't actually see the fossils. They're too small to see. And they're also invisible when you first <laughs> dig them up. But they really are there. Please, can we have 20,000 pounds? And everyone's just like, yeah, sure. <laughs> it was um yeah basically yeah <laughs> people around here know us i mean we've been um, running a local fossil group for nearly 10 years yeah. um you know we and we are we have been through the academic group we have published a lot so people know that we can recognize fossils yeah. <laughs> so we actually had contributors who were scientists around yeah, the world yes. as well it wasn't just local people mm -hmm. um but yeah, it, that was about the size of it, and we yes. we just sort of did a little video with the uh, the landowner and um, sort of talking about how exciting it was to find these sort of things and uh, and. But yeah, we weren't expecting that sort of response. Yeah, but what uh, we did was we kept the crowdfunding campaign going, um, really, so we could keep uh, doing updates. So for during field season, we'll be doing fortnightly Zoom meetings where we'd show people what we collected in the last fortnight. As in show them live down the microscope and show them oh, how cool. all the equipment works. And, yeah. and the other thing is that part of the crowdfunding was, because we're not the only people in the situation, we wanted to make these microscopes available to any amateur scientists in Wales who need them. Oh, wow. The border or whatever. Yeah. So, so we have had a few people come to take photographs of their fossils here, or yeah. in one case, their electrical circuits. Yeah, well, they're, they're failed capacitors with yeah. tin dendrites, which had never been photographed before. <laughs> I'm just thinking of all the rocks that I need photographing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, come yeah, along, yeah. come along. <laughs> um, are there any more plans for crowdfunding in the future? Could you uh, get some uh, field work crowdfunded? We don't really need money for field work because we can just walk to the site. All we really need is a bit of time. Um, uh, we wouldn't rule out more crowdfunding if there were, it turned out to be something we needed. But yeah. you know, we've already got fantastic equipment, and we're not likely to need anything more for the future. Uh, I could do with one of those nice little desktop SEMs. That would be nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Our house is too full of fossils. <laughs> It's a good time to remind all the listeners that uh, you can back us uh, uh, PaleoCast on Patreon. Uh, you can back the uh, desktop SEM fund. <laughs> £10,000 a month. Um, Sounds good. So what is, uh, yeah, what's next for you? Are you just going to focus on what you've dug up so far and describe all of that stuff up? Are you going to go back every week and you can't resist the allure of finding new and excited things, exciting oh, yeah. things? Are you just going to do a bit of both? Yeah, it's a Mixed bit of both. both. And we've got lots of other fossils to write up as well, of course. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's got to be both, really, because some things we can write up, we've got enough material, or the specimens show enough detail. Others we could really do with another specimen. So mm. at that point, you, you've got to keep collecting. Who knows what else will turn up in the process? And there's no way that this is anywhere near exhausted. So, yeah. Well, some things we'd like to find, like, oh, axiod would be nice. And, uh, yeah, a whole one. I still yeah. haven't found a spiky lower pod. And <laughs> <laughs> you've got you off of but... Yeah, we, we've only got one possible bit of radiodont, which isn't very convincing. We could do it so, a better one. So, yeah. so. Um, <laughs> so it's just a combination, yeah. yeah. So that's the next couple of decades sorted for you then? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I suppose we ought to earn a living at some point as well, but... Ah, details, yeah. details. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm sure that we'll hear more about Castle Bank in the future. I'm sure we'll hear more about the kinds of things that you have discovered at that site. So uh, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your discovery with us. Oh, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. PaleoCast was brought to you by Dave Marshall and Liz Martin Silverstone with contributions from Tom Fletcher, Vish Venkat, and Elsa Pancharoli. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall-Smith.
Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association. But the show now relies on funding from you, the listeners. So, if you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs, and follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, then please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.